Welcome to Strange Familiars, Allison. Mm-hmm. How are you? Just as great as I was the first time we tried this a minute ago. Yep. <laughs> Even better now, maybe. That's what you get for getting distracted and distracting me. We have to restart. You're not sleeping through this episode, are you? Not yet. I mean, the jury's out. <laughs> it's not over yet. You didn't even remember. No, I didn't remember that I missed it last week. I'm yeah. sorry. Yes. I went out to look for Bigfoot, and you went sleepy time. That's fine. I didn't find Big. Went out the next morning, very early. Still didn't find Bigfoot? Still didn't find Bigfoot. Everything's inconclusive. I did record some, I don't know, we'll see if anything came out. I'll listen to it. If it did, probably make it onto a patron show, but it's nothing uh, nothing conclusive. But the one thing I did want to mention, I said last week is a few hundred yards away from Hex Hollow. It's not even that. Where he saw it a few steps later, I think, is basically into the park. I didn't realize that the hill, he saw it on one side of a hill. I didn't realize that hill basically w- was the park. I believe it is the park. Oh, okay. Yeah, it winds around in a weird way down there. Yeah, yeah, so it's it was right there. So, interesting. He's having the, he being Octavian, mm-hmm. is having the witness uh, second guest syndrome. Where you go, oh, did I really see something? I don't know. Like, he was. When he showed up at our house, he was, he was like. His eyes were red. He looked. Yeah, he was I, upset. I thought that something happened because I thought he was upset about something else. Yeah. And he was later than he was supposed to be. So I was like, oh, did he get in an accident or something? No, yeah, he was, I mean, he seemed pretty shook, but now he's going through the, you know, maybe it was a bear. Maybe it wasn't what I thought. Maybe, which is natural. I mean, I think that happens. Yeah. I mean, I mean it's probably right to second guess on some level, right? Sure. Yeah. I mean, it happens so much with this stuff. Where even like Site 7, if I haven't been there for a while, I'll start thinking, I don't know, maybe maybe it's something else making those lights. And then I go there and I see them and it sort of like renews. It's like, oh, no, that can't be anything back there, anything man-made. But then, you know, some time goes by and you start to go, yeah, maybe, you know. So, yeah. It's Both a, are true. It's a totally natural part of the process. On well, tonight's show, I'm going to be talking with Tara, who heard the Green Claw episode we had not too long ago. A guy described a creature with a green claw and he seemed to see over and over again. And some of my favorite things that happen as regards Strange Familiars is when we have a guest on that talks about something like that and then I get an email, I've seen that. Yeah, yeah. So she saw that or she saw what she thinks is, is something like that. And she's got a bunch of other stuff besides. We'll talk to her in a minute. First, let's thank our patrons. Let's. Thank you, patrons. Thank you for everything you do. Thank you for your support. We could not make Strange Familiars without your help. If you like what we do here on Strange Familiars, if you like the content we make, and you want to get more, you can become a patron at Patreon. It's patreon.com slash strangefamiliars. There's different levels of support there. No matter which level you choose, our patrons get commercial-free versions of the weekly shows, plus extra episodes every month. We're trying to do two, but it's a busy time here, so we're doing at least one for our patrons, but we're going to try to do two every month. We've been able to stick to that so far, get to help us make the show, and get commercial-free versions of the weekly shows. Again, it's patreon.com slash strangefamiliars. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash strangefamiliars. All right. Let's talk with Tara. Besides this green creature, she's got some ghost stories and some shadow people stuff, some poltergeist stuff, and some pretty interesting dreams she shares with us as well. So let's go ahead and talk to Tara. I'd like to welcome Tara to the show. How are you doing tonight, Tara? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm doing good. Well, you contacted me after the Green Claw episode, and you said you might have seen the same thing or something like him. 
And uh, I was quite interested to get this story, but I think you have some other stories as well, don't you? Uh, I do. Yeah, kind of like a lifetime of them. <laughs> oh, nice. Well, we always like that. <laughs> All right. Well, I guess, do you want to go in, in chronological order? Yeah, just I'll just dive in. <laughs> sounds great. I'll ask questions um, as you go along. Sounds good. Okay. So I was about maybe six or seven when I saw this green guy. That, that's how I've referred to him. Mm-hmm. My sister and I lived with our dad in an apartment in Southern California, and she's two years younger than I am. And uh, I've always been horror obsessed, even as a small child, but sometimes we'd kind of get a little riled up about that. And then we'd beg my dad to sleep in his bed. So we'd go to bed early. We'd go to lay in his, we'd go to sleep in his bed. And the way that the apartment was situated was, for long story short, you could basically see just into the bedroom to where we were laying from a spot in the living room. So light, if anyone was in the living room, there was always light shining almost into the bedroom. So we would always leave the hallway door open and then my dad's bedroom door open. And that's kind of important, I guess. Okay. Um, and so one one night I wake up because I feel something kind of funny on me. And I could tell my sister was still next to me. She was sleeping. The light from the living room was still shining in like completely normally. Usually when I dream, it's dim. Mm-hmm. If it's not like a bright daytime scene, it's it's very dim. So anytime it's inside houses or anything, it's very dim, dimly lit. This was very bright, like normally like my dad was still awake and sitting on my chest is this green creature now he's faced away from me which was weird but he he was uh, maybe a foot and a half tall from from his seated position he was faced away from me but he was close enough and the lights the light was on so I could see even the detail of his, in his little arms, I could see like muscle shape. I could see not scales, but definitely a texture in his skin. Mm-hmm. And his, the back of his head was rounded. And on top of the head were two pointed ears, quite large. And uh, he was muttering. I say he, for lack of a better term, it. It mm-hmm. was muttering in this little voice. I could not understand what it was saying. And it was moving its arms like it was fiddling with something in front of it. Mm-hmm. I don't know if that was something he had in his lap or if it was like my bedclothes or something. Mm-hmm. But I saw this thing. And as soon as my brain registered what I was seeing, I just I screamed at the top of my lungs. And unfortunately, I don't remember much after that, but I definitely don't remember waking up. I think I was awake. And uh, I asked my dad kind of recently, actually, if he had remembered me ever saying anything about a little green something or other. But unfortunately, he doesn't. But that doesn't mean a whole lot uh, coming from him. But yeah, so when your guest came on, I believe his name was Garrett. Mm-hmm. It, it was just kind of wild, the similarity in description of what he would see regularly, except I've only seen this little one. I, I only saw him that one and only time. When he was sitting on your chest, could you feel the weight of him? Yeah, I think that's what woke me up. Okay, yeah, that's creepy. But he wasn't, <laughs> he wasn't very large, so there wasn't a whole lot of weight. Mm-hmm. And then his slender build... I know that when I tried to describe it to some people in the past, they've compared him to like, oh, you must have just watched the gremlins or something like Mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. But it definitely, he wasn't one of those types of gremlins. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) He never turned around and looked at you or anything. So you never got to see the face. No, unfortunately I didn't. Maybe Um, fortunately, who knows? (laughs) Well, Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, maybe fortunately. And did you notice any um, other details? Like, was there hair or anything? Or 
seemed to be hairless. He was completely hairless. Wow. He was just covered in that smooth, kind of a deep green skin, for lack of a better term. Like I said, he he didn't have scales, but there was definitely a texture to the skin. Mm -hmm. Almost as if I were to reach out and touch it, it would feel similar to a basketball, maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Yeah, but... Um, Unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, I have only seen it that one time. Yeah. And um, you didn't get to see its its hands or its feet, really? I think its legs were kind of thick, but I didn't see its feet because of the way it was sitting on yeah. me. Yeah, facing away from you, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, the legs were a little bit thicker comparatively to its the way its arms were built. Its arms were pretty slim, but with muscle definition. Mm -hmm. The way like a maybe like a swimmer would have so like slim but but strong arms yeah but the rest of it yeah the legs uh, were thicker in build but that's about a, all I can recall wow well I guess you yeah know, maybe it's a good thing you, you never saw him again I don't know <laughs> did, yeah did, did I mean, more things happen in this apartment not really in the apartment and I was kind of. I was kind of, my mind was more kind of um, taken up by what was going on in my life at the time, mm -hmm. which wasn't great. Yeah. yeah. I did discover auditory pareidolia, though, at that same, around that same time, which will come in later. Okay. But uh, when I was little, I would lay, I'd turn on, when I would go to take a shower, I'd plug up the bathtub too, so it would fill up. Mm -hmm. And then I would just lay in the bottom and listen to the sound of the shower water hitting the um, the tub as it started to fill up. And then one day I started hearing symphonies play under the water. Oh, wow. Yeah. I found out much, much, much later in life that that's just auditory pareidolia. Mm -hmm. But that's when I first started experiencing it. And then from when I was little... I have always felt watched, like eyes on me all the time. I mean, maybe it's anxiety, but <laughs> ever since a very young, young age, like around five, six, seven, no matter where I was, if I was by myself or with people, I always felt watched. And then to that pareidolia, later in my late teens, I ended up living with uh, my high school boyfriend at his parents' house. Each night for a period of time when I would lay down to sleep, that I would start to hear voices of people talking, almost like talking in another room. Mm -hmm. Now, most of the time auditory pareidolia happens when there is another sound, uh, like white noise going on, and your brain is trying to make sense of it. So it kind of turns it into something that it recognizes. So people can hear anything from, like I said, I, I would hear like symphony music playing. They can sometimes hear people talking. I get it now where, but I just hear screaming now, which is kind of terrible, but yeah. I know what it is. That's disturbing, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But I would hear people talking like they were having a conversation and it was always an elderly woman, a child, and two men. And the elderly woman would sometimes speak directly to me. Sometimes she would speak to the child. And it was as if I was hearing like a conversation in another room. Mm -hmm. And then the men were always talking to them, talking amongst themselves. Sometimes now I still hear the men talking amongst themselves. And I don't know if that is pareidolia, only because it's the same voices. And then to add a little bit of like kind of weird woo to that, I had a, she's what's known as a seer, kind of like a psychic, mm -hmm. kind of like a mix of a few things. Mm -hmm. She told my sister and me that we attract the dead. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Would actually explain a lot of experiences for both of us growing up we have seen black shadows our entire lives but it for me it's never been malicious or scary it's just kind of been like oh that's a thing huh now are these yeah. in the form of of humanoid shapes like 
They mostly are. It's almost like the the shadow part when uh, the older TVs, when you would get the snow mm-hmm. on the picture. Mm-hmm. It's almost like that, but just different shades of black. Interesting. So, does, like, does it seem to have dimension? You know. Uh not really. They have feel for me. They have a feel like um. Sometimes I can feel them before I can see them. Mm-hmm. But I never really notice much dimension. Kind of like just looking at like scribbles on a paper almost. Like if somebody, oh, that's better. If somebody were to draw pictures, but in scribbles of like generally what a human shape looks like, that's kind of how they look. Okay. Wow. You know, we, we've had guests on talking about shadow people and they often, not always, but often describe them as blacker than black. So they mm-hmm. they could kind of stand out from the darkness around it. Yeah. This sounds different or am I wrong? No, not not terribly different because the black is very dense black. Okay. But it's it seems to be like almost like electric or moving in a way. So it's, that's super interesting because we've had other people and describe what they called static man. <laughs> oh. That looked like TV static. That's what they, they described it. Yes. Yeah. I think it's like it just a... Uh, a way to describe, like, I don't know, because it seems like they're, like, electric hmm. or that there's, like, some kind of, there's some kind of movement there within the shadow, Okay, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So my sister and I have both seen those, I mean, since as long as we can remember. She has had some scarier instances, I guess. But me, I've always just kind of taken it as, like, this is a thing that's happening and that's fine. Did you ever see them together? Um, Did you, you ever like both see one at the same time? No, not really. But that's because we didn't live in places long enough when we were older and could comfortably talk about it. Okay. She's eight years younger than I am. Mm-hmm. So I had been out of the house for a while before she we started talking about this stuff. So, yeah, then back to the the high school boyfriend's house. Mm -hmm. I lived there till I was about 21 and his room was in the attic. It was like half of the attic was finished to be his room. And then the other half was unfinished. And there was a small door in the separating wall Mm -hmm. so that you could still access the unfinished section, but it was always kept shut. One night we had been out and about and one of his best friends what had crashed at the house as well and in his room all three of us were in his room the way his room was set up because it was unfinished attic he never actually had a door there were carpeted steps leading up to basically straight into his room Mm -hmm. and for privacy there was a waist high wall that surrounded the stairway for privacy and safety on three sides Mm -hmm. So we're sleeping on one side of the wall. His friend was sleeping on the other side of the wall. In somewhere in the night, I start to hear shuffling around in the room. His room was not the cleanest. So (laughs) if anyone would move around, like you, you could hear it. I just laid there. I pretended to be asleep. The room was completely dark, but the shuffling kind of stopped. And then it was like someone taking a tentative step towards me. And another tentative step. And then I could feel them right behind my head, basically, because we were not butted up against a wall. It's kind of hard to explain the layout of the room. But the way we were laying, there was access to the the bed at our head and our feet. Okay. So this, whatever it was, at first I thought it was his friend. See, coming to see if maybe I was awake or something like that, why he would, I have no idea. But I just hear, you know, like step on another crinkled paper or wrapper <laughs> and I'm just laying completely still. And then I, the movement completely stops and then I feel something poke me. Uh-huh. And it was probably because for whatever reason, I was terrified. I don't know why I was so scared. Because his best friend was a very good friend of mine as well. We were all very close. No issues with anybody. But for some reason, that that touch, it felt like icy tingles in that spot. And it stayed there for a minute. And then it let go. It kind of 
backed off the poke and uh, I, I just stayed completely dead still. I didn't move. And then nothing like no shuffling back, no nothing. I mean, I couldn't really say anything or do anything at the moment. Everyone was still asleep. So in the morning, I asked the friend, I said, I said, did you try to see if I was awake last night? He was out. He said he had not moved. He hardly even woke up, you know, when we woke up. Mm -hmm. So what that was, no idea. That's also the same room I would lay and hear the, the voices at night. Yeah. In that same house, we were a little older. I think I was about 21, 20 or 21. I was kind of furious because my boyfriend hadn't come home from a party that I stayed home from. And I was up, I was walking from the hallway through their front room into the kitchen. And I'm walking, I'm kind of walking slow because they have this big, awesome bay window where you can see straight out into the street and the neighborhood. And I was kind of watching for my boyfriend to try to catch him coming in. So I was walking a little slowly. And then I get to the middle of the, about the middle of the room and right in my ear, I just hear clear as day, Dad, just like that, hmm. just a whisper in my ear. And I froze and I was kind of, I kind of looked around to see if somebody woke up and wanted to know, maybe wanted to know what I was doing or nothing, nothing. Uh, no one, no one was awake. I was by myself and I waited I kind of said out loud, yes, <laughs> <laughs> but that was it. There was no response. And I think that was the extent. I mean, other than the standard of shadows here and there, that was the extent of that house. After that house, we moved into an apartment. It was our, my, our first, my first apartment out of his house, out of my house. It was four of us. We moved into a two bedroom. We were all very early twenties and my boyfriend and I had split at the, we had broken up, but we were going to still try to play the friend thing. And it was just, it was just a lot of dramatics and unnecessary ridiculousness. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm laughing because I recognize it in my own life. That's all. Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 That, I think, I definitely think that stuff attracts what, I don't know, energies or depending on how your day-to-day -day is in your life, like if there's a whole lot of dramatics in the house, if you're constantly fighting or bickering or that house is or wherever, you know, the dwelling is, it's going to start to take on a darker feel and a heavier vibe, so to speak, if that makes sense. Yes. Well, my ex-boyfriend started having horrible nightmares. And one day he kind of bust into my bedroom and he said, were you messing with me last night? Were you seriously, were you messing with me? He used a different word for messing. Sure, but, <laughs> sure. Yeah. And I said, no, but what are you talking about? He said for a few nights, Someone had been coming into his room, a woman had been coming into his room set, telling him, wake up or you're going to die. Ooh. And he would, you know, jolt awake only for nothing to be there. So I guess he thought maybe I was messing with him or something. But um, he, that happened to him several times at that apartment. We probably somehow brought it in there because it wasn't a healthy environment. <laughs> right. Yeah. Those, those <laughs> times tend to stir up things. Yeah. Yeah. Same goes for another apartment I lived in later on in life. I'm sorry to whoever lives in the um, Fullerton apartment. I haunted it. I'm very sorry. <laughs> <laughs> what did you do? <laughs> it was just a really bad predicament with another boyfriend only uh worse by the time we both moved out of that place it wasn't it did not feel homey or anything it it, it was a pretty negative place mm -hmm. that's not even in my timeline outline <laughs> <laughs> after that apartment after that apartment i got my own place it was a lovely tiny little apartment an older building 
but this is Southern California. So our older buildings are like, we get excited about buildings built in like the 1920s. Right, yeah. <laughs> um, so this building was built somewhere around the 1910s and 1920s, also in Southern California. This apartment was, the building was legitimately haunted. And none of the other tenants, there were four tenants on the bottom and four on the top. You, it was a big square building. And you would go through the front door, and it was like a wood floor landing. And there were two apartments in the front and two towards the back. And then there was a wooden staircase that went up to another uh, wood floor landing. And there were two apartment, two more apartments in the front, two towards the back. I had the apartment, um, if you're facing it, the building, I was up on the top floor on the right side and haunted or not that place was wonderful it was awesome <laughs> every night for a long for a long period of time around between 10 and 11 p.m the footsteps would start now we weren't all the tenants though there were few of us we didn't aside from hi bye uh, we didn't really chit chat but we did because of how loud the inner landings were from people coming and going, like you got to know people's routines and every night between 10 and 11, I would hear footsteps and they would come up the stairs, the wooden steps, and then they would come up to the landing and then they would kind of just circle the landing, circle the landing and then stop. And after a while of hearing this, I would hear walking and I would look at the time and, oh, okay, it's, it's the footsteps again. I tried several times to catch something or somebody I would throw up in my door. <laughs> like once the, at different times, I would right, wait right. till the steps got, or the footsteps got to the top of the stairs. I'd wait till they made a, a lap around the landing. Never, I could never see anything. Never. And then eventually they just stopped. And then I don't know if it escalated or if it just kind of switched up. But soon I was hearing knocks inside my house, my apartment, I should say. So each apartment was built with a, when you open the front door, you're in a hallway. And the hallway extends all the way to the other end of the apartment, which is not long. Mm -hmm. But on the left side, you have first the door to the bathroom and then a doorway into the kitchen. And then on the right side, you have first the doorway into the bedroom and then a doorway into the living room. And the living room and the kitchen also shared a doorway. And one night I heard tapping on the inside of my apartment on the wall that uh, split the hallway from the bedroom. It was okay. just a little, just a little wrapping. And I got out of bed and I looked, nothing, no big deal. The next night that I heard it, the wrapping was closer to my bedroom door. And I didn't get up to check. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I should also say that this building did occasionally have rats in the walls, which for the amount I was paying, I was not going to complain. <laughs> but I know what, <laughs> I know what they sounded like. This was not rats in the walls. This was deliberate tapping, kind of like a one, two, three knock. The next night that I heard it, it was even further down the wall, closer to my bedroom door. It continued like this until eventually it was in my living room, tapping on my bedroom wall from my living room because the living room and my bedroom also shared a single wall. Okay. So then it was knocking from my living room. And if they were pipes, that'd be one thing, like hot water sometimes. But Southern California, you don't get that a lot because there's not a whole lot of temperature change mm -hmm. within the walls of a, of a house or apartment. We just don't get the extreme weather that might be caused knocking and, and such from when the hot water turns on Yeah, or yeah. something to that effect. Yeah. And I mean, what could I do about it? Nothing. I just kind of sat there and... I was like, okay, well, this is a thing. And eventually it stopped. Just kind of like little experiences like that throughout my entire life. 
which could be something, could be nothing, but combined with uh, the black shadows, I think it's something. Do you feel like the shadows, the knocks, the footsteps, all these various things are related to what the seer told you about the, the dead being you know, drawn to you? I mean, it could be. I didn't find this out until I was in my 30s. Mm-hmm. Well, I find this out like this is what somebody told me. Right, right. She, I didn't see this woman until my 30s. I'm in my later 30s now. So it did kind of make things feel more like they maybe had a, a reason mm-hmm. or at least a, uh, oh, like maybe it was a spirit or maybe it was a something. But the problem is, all she said was that they're drawn to us, not like, if you need to stop it, here's how. Or right, right. if you <laughs> if you want to better communicate or anything like that, here's how. It's just like, oh, yeah, don't touch. What did she say? Don't look directly at a dead person at a funeral. That was her advice. Oh, wow. Huh. And then they would want to latch on to you. Huh. Wow. How indirect do you have to be? <laughs> you need to set up a system of mirrors or what? Uh, I guess just um, be the rude person and don't go up and pay your respects. I, I don't... It sounds like, I mean, other than the thing sitting on your chest and whatever poked you that night, they're not, like, super disturbing. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, for a child, heck yeah, it's terrifying. Yeah. But thinking back on it, wasn't doing anything scary at that moment. Mm -hmm. It wasn't, nothing bad actually was happening. And... I can't say the only time I ever experienced anything genuinely creepy was a dream I had. I'll try to make it short and to the point, but I always have, my sisters and I always have incredibly vivid dreams. Sometimes to the point where I can't wake up until my dream is done Mm -hmm. or it gets to a certain point where it's like, okay, I'll let up. And it was kind of my earlier 20s. I should say I don't believe in the Christian descriptions of things. So I don't necessarily, I don't believe in a devil or Satan. I don't believe in one single God. But in this dream, I was in a forest, in a clearing, and I was sitting across from two or three men. There was a fire in between us. And they were dressed kind of like, I don't know, maybe woodsmen. Uh, or hunters and they were talking amongst themselves like we we were resting in this clearing and uh, we were bedding down for the night but me I wasn't paying attention to their conversation since I was on the other side of the fire I was actually having a conversation with the best way I could describe it would be the devil but he would not come into the fire the the ring of light He stayed just out of the ring of light, partially behind a tree trunk in the shadows. And his face was made of shadow Hmm. that was constantly shifting. So where his mouth would be when he would talk was just deeper shadow. Where his eyes were was just deeper shadow. And he was trying to tell me about all these fantastic things that he was doing and how he was kind of like kind of a a badass and (laughs) bragging on himself again yeah (laughs) yeah he was kind of bragging on himself and what he could do and i was just kind of laughing it off and i was kind of like bsing with him in a very familiar kind of way Mm -hmm. in the middle of our conversation because there's some space between us between the log I'm sitting on in the clearing and the edge of our clearing where the devil is standing behind a tree trunk. In the middle of our conversation, this very large, like very tall, 
man, white, long hair, white beard, carrying like a big sack on his back and just wearing kind of long robes. Um, if he was wearing red, I would think Santa Claus. Okay. But he was not pleased with me. And he was just kind of like looking at, looking down at me as he passed through our clearing. And I'm the only one that really took notice. The hunters couldn't have cared less. And he walks past me and he doesn't say anything, but he looks at me and he shakes his head like in disdain. And I look at him and I'm just like, keep going. Like, that's kind of my attitude. Like, I don't care. Uh -huh. And once he gets through the clearing, me and the devil keep, well, he keep me and the devil continue our conversation. But the devil tells me something and I start laughing at him. And kind of in like a, yeah, right, give me a break. And I'm laughing. And suddenly he's right next to me and he has, he's grabbed me and he's whispering in my ear. I don't know if I can cuss, but he's saying, you're such a bitch, Tara. You're such an effing bitch. You're such a bitch. But I'm waking up as I'm hearing this in my ear. Oh, wow. My eyes are open in my room and I'm still hearing him with telling me, like oh, he's pissed uh, and that's creepy yeah 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 wow um i don't know if it's kind of like a bragging right that even the devil thinks you're a bitch but... <laughs> <laughs> oh, i my don't goodness. know <laughs> i have to ask do you remember what the woodsmen were wearing yeah they were wearing very nondescript clothes and it was um more like it would be more woodsmen from long ago they, not like you know they weren't wearing flannels and jeans and boots or anything like that they okay. were wearing leathers okay they gotcha. were wearing um because um, of flannel man's appearance on the show i have to ask if there's any any you know buffalo plaid involved oh <laughs> yeah no no buffalo plaid involved in oh. this experience okay all right that I think that was the the creepiest thing I can remember. Which... Yeah, I mean, having had some things, you know, follow me out of dreams or something like that, I don't know what to make of that. Is it something <laughs> from this world that can enter into your dreams and mess with you? Is it something in dream world that can, you know, step out of your dreams in a sense, at least for a, a small amount of time? I don't know. Yeah. I don't know, but yeah, those are always really weird. Yeah. The only other time I've, I've ever seen anything out of my dream, I used to have like an entire dreamscape. I'd have repeat dreams where I would be in repeat places. So towns, one was a crescent shaped beach that was just beautiful. And one was the outside of a two story white bed and breakfast. And I swear it's in Maine. But I have never found anything that looked like it. But everything is was connected by hiking trails. And I could go into one dream and then think to myself, oh, I need to take this trail because I want to actually go visit this other place. For the longest time, it was just, it was beautiful. The trekking through the dreams was fantastic. It was a bit like uh, out of a uh, Lovecraft story. He's big on using uh, dreamscapes. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of what every time I read uh, uh, certain stories of Lovecraft, that's exactly where it takes me back to. But one time I dreamt of three specific looking men. They looked like slightly Nordic, tall, uh, long blonde hair, blue eyes, and they were very friendly in the dream. And a couple of days later, I'm in this uptown area of where I used to live. And who do I see walking down the street, possibly dressed a little bit differently, but those three same guys. Oh, all three of them. Wow. I thought you were going to say one of them. Wow. No, all three of them. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there was no way I was going to approach them though. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes I kind of wish that I did because you know, you never know. Yeah. Why? Wh how do you dream about somebody you've never seen? And then suddenly, because I didn't hang out with anybody that looked like that at the time. None of my friends' friends were built like that because these guys were very tall. Very tall. 
And uh, yeah, that was kind of wild. But that's the only other time that something popped out of the dream world into the real world for yeah. me. Yeah, yeah, that's cool though. Yeah, I wonder what you know, good or bad. I wonder what would have happened if you just said, "Hey, do I know you, right? Guys? <laughs> right? You look very familiar. Where do I know you?" From? <laughs> I know. And then they I, take I you in a put... spaceship and you're never seen again, or maybe, may, you know, maybe <laughs> the, the greatest adventure you've ever had, you know? Yeah. Missed, uh, missed connections. I should put out, put out an ad in a <laughs> yeah, there you go. Cra- Craigslist. Craigslist missed connections. <laughs> <laughs> Did you ever um, have sleep paralysis? I had it only one time. He's now my husband, but it was when we were dating his apartment. I woke up in the night and because something was pulling on my sheets. Mm-hmm. I couldn't move, and there was only a small space between my side of the bed and the wall. And in that small space, something small had the sheet, and it was kind of dancing with it. Like, I don't know, doing kind of, almost like a teasing, like if a kid were to come and like tease you, like, oh, I have your sheet, I have your sheet. Right, right. I mean, it was like right up in my face, but it was behind the sheet. So I couldn't see what it was. I could just see where it was holding it and like with hands and moving it up and down. Mm -hmm. That's about it. And I I couldn't scream. I couldn't move. That's the extent of my sleep paralysis. Did you wake up from that or did you fall back to sleep? I think I fell back to sleep Mm -hmm. because I couldn't do anything else. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I couldn't scream, nothing. And then not being able to see, I think not being able to see what was right up in my face, but behind a sheet kind of freaked me out. Sure. Yeah. And <laughs> but that, that's all it did. I didn't feel anything. I didn't feel any pressure. I didn't feel any, anything like that, that other people will sometimes feel when they're experiencing mm-hmm. sleep paralysis. Mm hmm. Thank goodness. <laughs> yeah, that's about it for my sleep paralysis. Were you aware of what sleep paralysis was? When I had it, like there was, like people didn't talk about sleep paralysis, you know, at least to my knowledge. I'd never heard anybody talk about it in, you know, 1988 or whenever mine started. So I didn't know what yeah. it was. I was completely freaked out. But oh, yeah. Did you kind of know what, what, what was going on as far as like, oh, this is sleep paralysis? I didn't at the, at, when I was experiencing it. Mm -hmm. Um, I had heard about it before though, because like I said, I've always been obsessed with like anything horror and then anything occult as well. Like ever since I was little. Mm -hmm. So I often listen to things, uh, listen to podcasts related to these types of things. And there was even a, I watched a documentary about sleep paralysis I think it was on Netflix within the past couple of years. Yeah, I never, I, I heard it was so terrifying. I actually never watched it for that reason. Everybody's like, oh, it's so scary. <laughs> it was, it was terrifying because these people, they still experience the same creatures and then they just get worse and worse and worse as they get older. Wow. I, I think they were like, they, their casting call was like, you know, who, who has had the absolute worst time? Right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Cause those are the people we want to talk to. I was pretty creeped out by that, but yeah, luckily never experienced anything remotely as terrifying. Like I said, all of my experiences have, I mean, they've been numerous, but mostly benign. And I, but I think part of it is just because I just, accept it and I kind of don't let it like if something starts to put me on edge I will block it out or I'll immediately say nope I'm not I'm not playing you I'm not playing with you Mm -hmm. you know Mm -hmm. and uh, I try to put up a mental block or something to that effect yeah Um, definitely our approach to this stuff and maybe not 100% of the time but often can affect if you approach something with a lot of fear and with a lot of negativity, Mm -hmm. you you tend to get a measure of that back. So the fact that you're more accepting and more just like, well, this just let it happen. It's not hurting me probably adds to the, the generally uh, positive or neutral uh, experiences that you've, you've had. Yeah. Yeah. You're probably right on the money about that. My last 
Well, one of the last experiences that was kind of very recent and exciting for me, I am kind of obsessed with this town in Arizona called Jerome. Mm-hmm. And it is a super cool, it was an old mining town, silver mining, I believe. Then it kind of went to ruin. It became a ghost town in the 60s and 70s, I want to say. Hippies started moving in and it kind of revived it. And now it's fully like it's it's mostly a normal town now, except they know that like, yeah, we're a ghost town because there are ghosts here. Mm -hmm. It's also really funky. Like there will be a gorgeous Victorian home right next to like the ruins of the original school. Mm -hmm. It's such a neat town. They have turned the old hospital into a hotel. So I always try to go stay there (laughs) when I have, um, you know, like some mom time to get away. Mm -hmm. My last time I went to go visit my cousin who lives in Arizona, I booked myself room at the Jerome Grand Hotel. And somebody told me that it's probably some kind of vortex. They put me in what was the old maternity ward. My room was Mm -hmm. in where the old maternity ward was. And before I went to sleep the first night, I called out and I said, look, I'm totally cool with you letting me know you're here. Please just don't wake me up. I want to sleep. And lo and behold, sometime in the middle of the night, There's like a crash bang in the bathroom that woke me right up. But I just said, you know, look, I asked you not to wake me up. Please don't wake me up. So I went back to sleep. And in the morning, I went into the bathroom. There was nothing at all had been moved. Nothing had been messed with. I don't know what that crash bang could have been. It's a very, it's a very quiet hotel as far as uh, at least that area, that end of it Mm -hmm. is. Like, you you can't hear through the walls. You can't hear people, the TVs on or anything like that. In fact, I don't think they have TVs. I don't think there are any TVs in the rooms. So it's a very quiet place. There are pictures that I had taken. And honestly, I was trying to get a repeat of some pictures that an ex-boyfriend had taken years prior. We went me it was my ex boyfriend at the time uh my best friend and me we went and stayed there he was not a good person and i wonder if that has that is why the second he gets up into the hallway he starts taking a bunch of pictures with his um smartphone and we get into the room and he starts looking at the pictures right away there's a red mist That starts at the end of the hallway. And you can tell by the way the light is coming in because all of the doors of the rooms have little windows on above them that still open. Mm -hmm. So light filters in through them. So you can see this red mist in each picture coming closer and closer up one side of the hallway And then in another picture, it kind of crosses to the other side of the hallway, comes closer, and then disappears. I unfortunately never got those pictures from him, but I was trying to see if I could get something similar. The pictures that I got were not as exciting, but still interesting as there is a little blue light that is kind of traveling around in some of the pictures, but I never posted them anywhere or anything because it could probably be considered just kind of some kind of lens issue or something to that effect. Yeah. It's only in a few of the photos out of a series of several that I took all at the same time. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of moving around in one area. That wasn't as exciting, Mm -hmm. but that night, I go to bed and the uh, ex-boyfriend that I had lived with when I was in uh, in my late teens, lived with him at his parents' house, Mm -hmm. he unfortunately had passed away maybe a year or two prior to my stay. 
And I had been feeling really kind of not guilty, but kind of cut up about it because of the way he passed. It was just not good circumstances. And I had been thinking about it for a little while. And so that night in the dream, I'm stressed out about a situation and I walk away from the situation into a clearing in the woods and I see him and I said, oh my God, it's you. Hey, um, what's going on? And we hold hands and are just walking just normally. And he said, asks me, why do you want to go through all this stress anyways, referring to the situation I walked away from. And we kind of chat about that. I look at him, I stop, and I say, how are you? Are you okay? He starts to tell me, but then this big dude appears out of nowhere and is kind of, is making motions like, all right, dude, it's time to go. Talking to uh, my deceased friend, Mm -hmm. ex-boyfriend, and kind of like a bouncer almost. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I kind of grab onto my, to him and I say, wait, wait, talk to me. Are, are, are you okay? And the bouncer is the, it's like the, the more insistent I am that I speak with my friend, the more insistent the bouncer is that they leave. And I grabbed him and I hugged him before the bouncer could pull him away. And I said, said the words, I miss you so much. But what I meant to say, even in my head was, I'm so sorry. Mm -hmm. And even like, you know, like your emotions convey, you can convey things with your emotions in your dream. Yeah, I was conveying like my apologies and just how sad I was about the situation. And the bouncer starts pulling him away. And I said, but wait, what is it like? What is it like where you are? And he grabs me by the arm and he pulls me close and he says, I've seen so many things. And then he just, he lets go and he lets the bouncer take him. Oh, wow. Yeah. And then that was like, that was the end of the dream. And I mean, maybe for somebody listening to this is like, oh God, what do you do? You know, but in dreams, so much more is conveyed aside from you know, what people are saying Mm -hmm. as far as, I mean, even pictures that can be put into your head, you know, into your little dream head while you're dreaming. And it was really kind of profound for me because we weren't necessarily on speaking terms when he did pass, even though I did, I sent him a message just saying, you know, I hope you're still doing what you love and I hope everything is great and don't give up your talents because you have so much of it. And then I just left it at that. And then he passes and then this dream, I genuinely think that, you know, it, it was him Mm -hmm. coming to say, you know, exactly what he said in our little conversation. But in Jerome, like on almost no matter where you take pictures, there's something in them. There's some kind of anomalous something. And then you can say, oh, yeah, well, that's it's dust, or that's this, or that's that. But it's so much and so many that I think that's why somebody explained it as like a vortex. Mm-hmm. And it's also near Sedona, which is also like a big... Right, yeah big woo place. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So yeah, that was my last, I think that was my most recent experience as far as anything outside of the black shadows. Mm -hmm. Sometimes there's a lot of them. Sometimes there's one or two. They mostly come at night when I'm resting and then I can feel them before I see them. Hmm. If that makes sense. So when I'm like laying, closing my eyes, I can feel them. Uh, I one, or several, either at the foot of my bed or approaching me on the side of my bed. Or if I just have my eyes open, just laying in the darkness, I can see them gather. Wow. Like I can see one or two at the foot of my bed. Or sometimes if I reach out, like I'll try to reach out mentally. I don't try to get too crazy with it because I don't know exactly how to go about it. Mm-hmm. And I'm terrible at meditation. Mm-hmm. Terrible. I, um, I get that. 
<laughs> but I will try to just close my eyes and just kind of reach out uh, and say like, hey, you know, anybody here? Sometimes then I'll feel them like above me. Like while I'm laying down, it's almost like I can feel them above, like above my body. Like leaning over um, or hovering? Hovering. Interesting. But yeah, so far, I mean, that's about that. It sounds like when they're there, you can look directly at them. Yeah, yeah. Like, sometimes they, the, they... with the shadow people, people say like, oh, I, I can only see them sort of like my peripherals. And if I try to look right at them, they're, they're gone. Well, yeah, I experienced that too, um, especially with the smaller little black. They're like cat-sized, mm -hmm. I want to say, but I'm not a cat fan <laughs> at all. I've never owned a cat. So I can't say like, oh, yeah, it's old mittens coming to visit or anything like right, that. Right. And maybe they're not, it's not cat form, it's just cat size mm -hmm. or small dog size, if you will, mm -hmm. Pomeranian size. <laughs> so I've been seeing those quite often lately. And those will usually be in periphery. Mm -hmm. And then the during the day, that's mostly when the shadows are only in periphery. But at night, it's like I can look right at them. That's wild. It's interesting for sure. Yeah, it's, and it seems like your approach is generally positive, and and you haven't had you know, like I said, too many negative experiences. So keep doing what you're <laughs> yeah. doing, I guess. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'll just keep on keeping on. <laughs> and anything, uh, anything you know, major happens, you know where to call, contact us. Oh yeah, absolutely. Just to go back to the very beginning to that first experience with the green thing. Uh, that mm -hmm. was in Southern California also? Yeah, I've lived in Southern California my whole life. Okay. So other than my visits to Jerome, everything mm -hmm. has been in California. Okay. Like you say, I think it's the people mm -hmm. that oh, yeah. can be yeah, that's, haunted. I would, or... Yeah, I wanted to bring that up. Yeah, I don't think it matters where you go. I think you're going to have this stuff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'll have my little beacon going even though I don't know. Yeah, it's how just, to activate it or turn it off. Or... <laughs> some people just have stuff, you know, and I, I don't know why or, or how, or sometimes you can try to point to one reason or another, but I think, I don't know that we get to know in the end. Some people just have stuff, you know, some people have to seek yeah, it out. Yeah, I, I think most of the women on my mom's side will, they all have stories. Mm -hmm. That's common as well, which you mentioned about the crash in the bathroom and then going and looking and there's nothing out of place. That's pretty common. We hear that. This yeah. is, I'm not saying you're this is incredibly interesting to hear about. And I like, you know, having an aggregate of these stories. So when people listen, they're like, oh yeah, that happened to me. That happened to me. And we can kind of build a catalog of these things that these experiences, like a checklist, you know, this happens sometimes, this happens sometimes. Nothing, you know, you can't say any one thing's going to happen all the time. But uh, yeah, yeah, these are, these are things that, that other people have reported, which is really cool. Yeah, and also so many people have had so many similar experiences. It kind of makes it harder and harder to say, oh, it's your imagination. Right. Or, oh, it's the fridge or right. make a noise. or Yeah, science hates this stuff because it's, you know, <laughs> it's, it's outside of the normal stuff and you can't reproduce it in a laboratory and stuff. But And because witness testimony, they say it's completely unreliable. And, and with one witness, yes. But when you have an, yeah. uh, witnesses over time, hundreds of them, and then thousands of them that are all talking about the same thing, then you go, well, okay, well, you know, is there something there then when, when these stories check out across all these different witnesses? And that's one of the, the things I like about Strange Familiars. It's one of the things we're kind of doing. And like with the, the little green guy, like we might yeah. hear from two or three other people now. So uh, yeah, I heard it too, or I saw it too, rather. That would be so exciting. And yeah, the the all the different stories that do have similarities, that's one thing that keeps me coming back to your podcast. I have enjoyed it immensely because uh, I just started fairly recently listening. So I've been like, I'll listen to a new one and then go back and listen to a couple older ones mm -hmm. and back and forth. And yeah, it's just the similarities, but also the, the slight differences because everybody's human experience is going to be different absolutely just based on the person but i think many of us are experiencing the same thing just through different eyes absolutely if that makes sense absolutely that's perfect and a great way to wind up the interview thank you tara for sharing your stories thank you so so much for um having me on and uh letting me <laughs> letting me ramble on <laughs>
These are interesting. They're not as creepy as your usual doll fare that you bring us here on Strange Familiars, Allison. But these are special. What are these? They are cabinet cards of dolls that were models for a Vogue fashion show in the 1890s. So the the dolls are wearing uh, dresses that you could potentially make for yourself. So if you went to this fashion show, you could either have someone make these dresses or make them for yourself. And the, they were very popular like um, with very wealthy people like the Astors and the more moneyed New York City. So this was like seriously high fashion at the time. Yeah, this is like super high fashion and they would clothe these dolls as models. Oh, wow. That's pretty cool. And when you look at them really quickly, you just think they're women, but um, they're actually... Yeah, they're little dolls. That's neat. And well, I, I assume they're little. I don't know. Maybe they're life size. Are I don't you... think so. They don't look proportionally life size. And you can see there's tiny little signs. If you oh, get out yeah. of loop, you can read what number they are. Oh, interesting. Well, that's really cool. But as far as like unusual doll photographs, I think these are yeah quite We're... rare. I've never seen anything like that. Nor I. I had to look up to try to figure out what the context was, and I was able to find a, a newspaper ad for the show. Oh, is that how you tracked down what they were? Yeah, because there's an, a word on the back, and I don't know if it's the photographer's name, but I didn't find anything related to that. Mm-hmm. Huh. Yeah, one says number 12, the other number 7. I'm guessing there were others. Yep. Very cool. These are really, really neat. Somebody should, will want these. I should hope so. Yes. So we'll put them both up. You can buy either or both. There'll be an image of one or both of those in the show notes. You can click on them. It'll take you to our Etsy shop where you can purchase those and other curiosities of the week. Also at Etsy, artwork, originals and prints, including the original of the episode art for this episode. My new art book, Elzik's Farewell. You can get that there. The new Stone Breath CD, Greys and Orphans. You can get Entity Drift, the ambient music from Strange Familiars I made. That CD's there. You can get Strange Familiars t-shirts, stickers, copies of my books. If you get them on Etsy, they come signed. Allison has other antique photography up there and much more. Our shop name is Lost Grave, but if you type in Strange Familiars over at Etsy, our stuff will come up. You'll see it. You can click on that and find our store that way as well. There's also a link in the show notes of every episode to our Etsy shop. All right, I think that's it for this episode of Strange Familiars. We'll be back soon with more. Strange Familiars is a production of Dark Holler Arts. Intro and background music is by Stone Breath. You can hear more Stone Breath and purchase music at stonebreath.bandcamp.com. Of course, the new Stone Breath CD, Grays and Orphans, is there, as is Entity Drift, the dark ambient music I did for Strange Familiars. You can get the new art book there as well, Elzik's Farewell, and much more, stonebreath.bandcamp.com. Strange Familiars is on Facebook, facebook.com slash strangefamiliars, where you can join the Strange Familiars gathering group. We're on Instagram, at strangefamiliars, one word, and you can find us on the web 24-7 at strangefamiliars.com.